Gentlemen, you'll notice that we're beginning our General Assembly a bit differently tonight, jumping right in before the band concert. And that is because we are honored to be joined tonight by your Illinois State Treasurer, Mr. Mike Frerichs. He has made time in his busy schedule. Go ahead. Mike's made time in a very busy schedule to spend a few minutes with us tonight, and we're delighted to have him here. Michael Frerichs was elected Illinois State Treasurer in November of 2014. In Illinois, the Treasurer is the state's chief investment officer, and Mike is a certified public finance officer. His office invests $25 billion on behalf of the state and local units of government. Mike also believes in providing individuals with the tools to invest in themselves. He does this by encouraging savings plans for college and trade school, increasing financial education among all ages, removing barriers to a secure retirement, and protecting residents from predatory companies. Mike was born in downstate farming community of Gifford, Illinois. He graduated from Yale University and spent two years in Taiwan where he taught English to young students and learned to speak Chinese. He has served as a Champaign County board member, Champaign County auditor, and as an Illinois senator. He also serves as a volunteer fireman. Mike is also a former Illinois Boy State citizen and a former winner of the Boy State Oratorical Contest. Mike lives in Champaign with his young daughter, Ella. Gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to your state treasurer, Mr. Mike Frerichs. Good evening, citizens. My name is Mike Frerichs. I'm the Illinois State Treasurer. Do I need to lift this at all? There we go. Uh, it is a pleasure, it is an honor to be back here tonight. I do have a busy schedule, but I look forward in coming to addressing the citizens here at Illinois' premier Boys State. So, I would talk to you about the things I do in my office, but I think that Jeff gave you a good overview of what I do in my office. And if you have questions you'd like to ask me about state budget, state treasurer's office, I'm happy to talk about it. But I want to talk a little bit about how I got here. How I, the, the path I took from leaving Boys State to becoming state treasurer, uh, and then answer some questions you might have if we have some time. You know, I'll get some of the questions out of the way just to start with. Uh, the answer to your first question is 6 8. Don't, don't worry, I, I know some of you were thinking it. People ask me, do you ever get tired about, of, of answering that question? And I tell people, I lived in Taiwan for two years. If you think I am tall in this country, you should see me there. The Taiwanese people were so very kind to me. They gave me free Chinese lessons every day. They taught me phrases like, Ni hang gao, ni shi zhi ren, ni da lan ma, which means, you are very tall, you are a giant, do you play basketball? For some reason, they thought I needed to practice those phrases an awful lot. You know, when I talk to especially young people, motivated young people like yourself, people who are leaders in your schools and your organizations, another question I get asked very frequently is, how did you become state treasurer? And by that, I assume they mean, hey, if I wanted to run for office someday, what, what things do I need to do? What is the path I need to chart to be an elected officer, an elected official like yourself. And I tell them, my path is a typical path. I went to college and I majored in German studies, where I spent a, a one summer studying the East German school system and how it changed after unification, and another summer restoring a castle in Eastern Germany near the Polish border. And then, logically, because I knew I wanted to be state treasurer, I moved to Taiwan, where I studied Chinese and taught English. I came back to the States, I moved to New York City for a little while where I worked as a paralegal at a large corporate law firm. I moved back to the Midwest to have a fellowship in public affairs with the Coral Foundation. I came back home, I started up an engineering company, monitoring bridges for structural integrity. I became the county auditor, I became a state senator, I became a state treasurer. 
So, pretty much a logical path to getting a state senate, or to getting a state treasurer, right? Everyone see the logic in that? Wow, I should, I should have you tell me the logic in that someday. It's, it's not your typical path. But what hopefully you learn from that is it is my path. It does not have to be yours. The logic in those different things that I have done is they were all things that I found interesting. You know, I didn't know anything about Eastern Germany when I went off to college, I knew very little. I didn't know much about Taiwan before I moved there. I was never studying to be an engineer before I started an engineering company. But there were things that were interesting and they were also challenging. I can tell you that there were times a few years after the wall came down in Eastern Germany, I was traveling by myself that I wondered, how did I end up here? And am I going to get back home safely? And the same thing in Taiwan. And there were days when starting up a company, I wondered, what kind of risk am I taking? Is this going to work out? But what I have found through life is that when I take a risk, when I challenge myself, when I step outside of my comfort zone, I find that I learn a lot more quickly. I like to use the example that if someone out, if any of you out there don't know how to swim, and you needed to be able to swim tomorrow, I can tell you the best way to learn to swim in a, in a hurry is to shove you in the deep end of the pool. Now, you might drown, but chances are you'll probably learn to swim a lot faster than by going to the library and checking out some books or watching a video on YouTube. My advice to you is if there's something you want to do, don't spend an awful lot of time studying for it. Just do it. Go for it. And you will learn more quickly than you would taking a class. And so that's my path. Your path probably won't lead you to Taiwan. Your path might not have you starting an engineering company. But if you find things that are interesting to you and challenge you, I guarantee you, you will find success. Generally, what I tell people when they say, well, do, do you think I should go to law school? Do you think I should run for some office first? My response to them is, does law school interest you? Do you want to go to law school? Because I can tell you, if you take a job just because you think it's going to get you somewhere, and you don't like that job, you are going to be miserable. And if you are miserable in your job, people will notice it. Now let me tell you a little, little something. People don't want to be surrounded with miserable people. But conversely, if you do a job that you love, if you take a job that interests you, you will show up early to work. You'll be one of the last ones to leave. And you will do that job with a smile all day long, and people will notice it. And that is the common thread for me. You know, I did things that I was interested in. I'd be the first one into, into the office, I'd be the last one to leave. People saw I was happy and they say to me, Mike, you seem like you're really good. You seem to like work. I'd like to invite you to come work for me. And that's kind of how I ended up along my path. Now, the other question people ask me is, when did you first get interested in running for office. As Jeff told you, I grew up in a small town. My family wasn't involved in politics. I didn't have many examples of elected officials. It wasn't something I was raised around. But like you, I was chosen for Boys State. And I came here 27 years ago, before any of you were born. And I tell you, I grew up without an awful lot of money. I knew I was going to go to college, and I knew it was expensive. And Boys State offered a scholarship for the winner of the oration contest. And that is how I chose to participate in the oration contest, in the hope that I could win a scholarship to make it a little, a little more affordable to go to college. And I happened to win. I won the contest. And that was the day that the governor of Illinois showed up. Now, the governor at the time was Governor Jim Thompson. Illinois' longest serving governor, he served for 14 years, four terms, they called him Big Jim Thompson because he was probably about 6'5 and 270 pounds and had a great big personality and I was not this tall at the time. 
I remember giving my speech and turning around, and there was Governor Thompson. And he put his hand out to me and said, son, that was a great speech. You can give me a call anytime and write speeches. You can write speeches for me anytime. And that's what planted the seed in my head. So here's my other bit of advice to you. This is something I didn't know I was going to do. I wasn't sure how to enter it. And like many of you, I was involved in sports. I enjoyed winning. No one, no one likes to lose. And I wasn't sure what I, how I would do and how I would fare. So I tell you, I left Boys State and I went back home to my high school and I ran for our senior class president. And I lost. Now, I left for a while, I came back home uh, several years later, and someone put this idea in my head that I should run for state representative. And I ran for state representative. I ran against a 22-year incumbent when I was 24 years old. He had never received less than 61% of the vote, re routinely received 70% of the vote. No one thought I could beat him. And I ran really hard, and I lost. I came closer than anyone ever had, but I lost. And so two years later, I was ready to run again, and I ran again, and then finally, no, I lost again. Now, the next time race I ran for, I won, and I've now won seven races in a row. But I tell you, I tell you this story because it's the same story I tell my daughter when she tries something new. In sports, we all know, that at the end of regulation, or at the end of so many innings, there is a winner and there is a loser. And as I said, I don't like being on the losing side. But in life, life is not a game. There are not winners and losers in life. And I tell my daughter the same advice I want to give you. In life, you either win or you learn. There is no finish line in life. It keeps going. And even though I lost that race for seeing class president, I think I lost some races in college. I lost twice for state representative. Each time, I sat and reflected on what I did wrong, what I could have done better. And by doing that, I think I learned an awful lot. And it got me to the place where I am today. So what I wanted to do, is rather than talk about all the wonderful things we do in the treasurer's office, which may or may not interest you, I want to give you an idea of who I am and how I came to be here today and hopefully provide some advice you might use as you leave here in Boise State. I know you'll all be leaving tomorrow afternoon. Hopefully you've made some great friendships. Hopefully you've had some great experiences. And I look forward to running into you years from now, just as I did with Governor Thompson. When I got elected to the State Senate, I told him the story. He came and saw me. I told the story of him shaking my hand, and we had a great conversation. And if you go out there, and you do things that are interesting to you. If you do things that challenge you, if you never let life tell you no, and you know you're never going to lose, you're going to keep fighting until you get what you want, then I will look forward to having similar conversations with you all someday in the future. So thank you very, all very much for inviting me back here to Boy State. It set me on a pathway in life, and I hope to see you follow a similar path. And with that, if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And that being said, um, with these lights behind you here, I can barely see any of you. So if you have a question, you'll have to wave wildly uh, or speak up. I see a, a hat up here in front and a waving hand. So for those who couldn't, who couldn't hear, he asked, after I lost, how long did it take me to decide I wanted to run again? And what kind of things I think was I thinking at that time? I tell you, when I lost that first time, even though everyone told me, you can't beat him. He's been there too long, he's too powerful, I still thought in my mind I could. Now let me tell you, it's, it is no fun uh, to lose on election night. Hey, thank you, I'll be able to see much better now. Uh, in my last election for state treasurer, on election night, I was down 20,000 votes. People encouraged me to quit. They said, just concede, you're losing. But see, I believe in democracy. 
and I believe that everyone has an opportunity to vote. And I knew that not all the votes had been counted. And I said, when every vote has been counted, if I am behind, I'll quit. I'll concede. Well, it took two weeks for all the ballots to come in, for all the ballots to be counted. And two weeks after the election, I ended up winning by 9,555 votes. It was the third closest statewide race in Illinois history. And people ask me, what was that like? Waiting two weeks, not knowing if you were going to win or not. You know, that must have been just gut-wrenching. I tell them, it was. I mean, it's miserable. There's nothing you can do but sit and wait to find out the outcome. But as bad as it was to wait two weeks to find out I won, it was a whole lot better than waiting two weeks to find out I lost. And I can say that because I did. I lost close races as well. So I'd say in my case, what happens with a lot of people, they run for an office and they lose, and they focus on the bad things that happen. Some people turn inward and they get really angry, and they say, the voters, the voters are idiots. They clearly had a better choice and they didn't choose me. I'm not going to give them the option again in the future. Now, I don't think the voters are dumb. I have more respect for voters than that. It still hurts. It still hurts very much. But I tend to focus more on the positive thing. Even though I lost, there were hundreds of people, some of which I, I barely knew when I started campaigning, who came out and volunteered for me. There were people at my fundraisers dropping off $100 bills who didn't look like they could really afford to be giving me $100. And I'd ask them, I'd say, you Frank, why are you doing this? And they said, Mike, we believe in you. We believe you will make things better. And that's why I'm contributing. And it's not just about you, it's about helping all of us. And I'll tell you, there is something very rewarding and humbling about that. And so it didn't take me very long afterward to focus on the things we had done and the people who had given and invested a lot in me. And I didn't want to let them down. I didn't really feel like quitting. So in that case, it didn't take too long. But everyone uh, has different, uh, different reactions to a loss. Over here. Uh, speaking, uh, you would, you run in, uh, no, I will not. Yes, I was going to run for governor in 2018. I like my job as state treasurer. Uh, I really could talk about it for a while. It is the best job in state government that no one really understands. You know, I get to invest about $25 billion. We make tens of millions of dollars in interest for the state. We help families to save for their kids' college education. We're helping children with disabilities have a brighter future. We're going to help more people save their own money for their retirement in an easy way that's going to help them better enjoy their golden years. And I'm also in charge of this program called Unclaimed Property, where literally it is my job to give people money. It's a wonderful job. So no, uh, there are plenty of other people who want to run for governor. Uh, I like this job. I'll run for re-election. Yes. Biggest problem facing Illinois today, there are lots of them, but it's obvious the biggest problem is the lack of a state budget. It's the lack of any sort of spending plan, any sort of certainty out there. I know that there are lots of things out there the state can be doing better. But I can tell you, as the state's chief investment officer, I talk to businesses and I talk to banks all the time, and what they're looking for, what businesses look for is some sort of stability. That's some sort of certainty of what's out there. Because what I've found with entrepreneurs, if you give them a problem, they will find a solution. If you tell them what their tax rate is, you tell them what regulations are, and they know what those things are, they can make plans to achieve their goals. But if you give them a moving target, if they don't know what tax rates are going to be, if they don't know if bills are going to be paid, that uncertainty stops them from making investments in our state. And I think as a result, rating agencies have given Illinois credit downgrade after downgrade after downgrade. We are one step above junk bond status as a state. I don't know if you know what junk bonds are. The name gives you a pretty good idea. When Illinois wants to raise money, we go out and we issue bonds. They're a promise. You give us money now, we'll pay you back a certain We'll pay it all back in the future with interest. But a junk bond is a bond that you can't really trust will be repaid. And for the state of Illinois to be just knocking on the door of junk bond status is 
inexcusable. And the rating agency has said, your elected officials aren't doing their job. We can't trust they will do their job in the future. So the number one problem facing the state is you have to have the governor and the General Assembly talking to each other. And they're not doing that right now. And I think part of the problem is that people are focused too much on the next election rather than the problems facing us right now. People are more interested in campaigning than in governing today. Uh, I'm going to switch sides because I've all been on this side. Yes? The biggest problem on my way to the current position, do you mean into getting it, or once I got there, what's the biggest problem here? Um, boy, uh, the biggest problem getting here. I mean, Illinois is a large state, 13 million people. Um, it takes an awful lot of money to reach those people. I mean, that's, that right there is the answer. Um, fundraising is the biggest problem. So I grew up in a town of 800 people. My dad's a truck driver, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, she eventually went back to work as a secretary. I didn't come from a lot of money, didn't have a lot of family with a lot of money, and to run a statewide race requires an awful lot of money. I mean, in this next election, our gubernatorial race is almost certainly going to set records for the most expensive governor's race, not in Illinois history, but in U.S. history. I, I, I will guess hundreds of millions of dollars will be spent on this race. I'm going to guess at least $200 million spent. I have no idea how to raise $200 million. I don't know where I get it. But what I did find is if you don't have the money, then your answer is you just have to work harder. And hard work never really scared me very much. You know, it means a lot more hours on the road, a lot more time shaking people's hands, a lot more time speaking in front of groups. But as I said, uh, hard work didn't scare me, and hopefully shouldn't scare any of you as well. All right, back over here. So in a time of divisive politics, what advice do I have? You know, I tell people, the only thing you can control is yourself. You know, people ask me, how do you like your job? But they don't say it like that. They say, how do you like your job? You know, like, if you found out someone broke their leg, and you say, how are you feeling? And I say, I love my job. And they look at me like, the poor guy doesn't even know. He has a compound fracture, a bone sticking out of his leg. They say, I, I watch the news. I read the newspaper. The state's a mess. How can you say you love your job? I tell people, the things we can control are going well. The things we can't control are out of our control. And we can't really spend a lot of time worrying about it. We can't spend a lot of time complaining about it because no one listens. And if they do, they don't really care that much. But the approach we've taken, and what I advise other people, is yes, there's divisiveness. Can you stop other people who are intent on dividing people? No. What can you do? Do not give in to it. Be an example. Be a light to other people. Now the problem is that takes an awful lot longer. It is, it is very easy to lose trust. You know, if people have faith in you, have trust in you, it's very easy to lose that. It takes a lot longer to rebuild that, but that's what we try and do. So in our office, rather than engaging in finger pointing and blaming, we came in, rolled up our sleeves and said, I want to reduce the fees families are paying for their college savings programs. Now, how do we do that? You communicate. I told our investment manager, I want you to reduce fees in our new contract. And how do you suppose they responded? Any guesses? No, exactly. In fact, no, they said, no, it can't be done. It can't be done. We've already cut all the fat in our program. We have cut the meat. You're asking us to cut through the bone. We can't do that. Now, if I wanted to engage in that divisive politics, I probably could have held a press conference. I could have stood in front of a microphone and cameras and said, that bank is stealing money from the people of this state. This bank doesn't care about our children. They only care about themselves and their profits. And I probably couldn't have got, I probably could have got on TV. I might have gotten some editorials written. And how much money do you suppose that attitude, that approach, would have saved people in this state? 
Above zero. So what did we do? We sat down and talked to them. And we actually spent some time listening to them. You know, I tell people, uh, God gave you uh, two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should use them in that proportion. Every minute you spend talking, you spend a couple minutes listening to people. And so we sat down and said, this is my priority, to lower the fees the families are paying. So more of their money goes towards their kids' college education, and less goes off to Wall Street. But you surely have some concerns as well. You surely have some things you want in addition to making lots of money. And they told us what those were, changes we could make to make the program run more efficiently. And after listening and working with each other, they went from saying, no, we can't cut fees, to cutting their fees by 53%. That puts millions of more dollars into Illinois students' savings accounts. And so, you know, my answer is, I could sit back and I could complain about this function. I could blame other people. Or we can work to actually find solutions. And that's what we did. And as a result, our Bright Directions College Savings Plan actually got a rating upgrade from Morningstar Rating Agency. There is proof that if people work together and they're interested in finding a win-win situation, you can move things forward. The problem is right now, people are looking for a win-lose. I want to win, and I want you to lose. And nothing gets done when you have that approach. Go back to this side. Uh, this guy stood up with a toga. I'll go back to the back. I assume most people heard you, what made me choose state level and not federal level. I, I'll be honest with you, when I first got into politics, I thought I wanted to go to the federal level. You know, I'd, I'd been to D.C., I liked D.C., and there were big issues to get tackled there. But I got involved in state government and really realized this is where my passion is. You know, I've lived abroad in Europe and in Asia. International interests, issues are of interest to me. But what really motivates me is education. I came from a small community. My family, my parents didn't go to college. Um, my teacher at school encouraged me, motivated me. And when I went off to college, it opened up new worlds to me. And I remember the day when uh, I got that acceptance letter. And I came home and I said, Mom, Dad, I got into Yale. And my dad's response was, good for you. You're not going. I said, what do you mean I'm not going? He said, we, we can't afford it. I said, he, he didn't go to college, never thought about college, never thought about saving or putting away anything for college. I, I remember I was upset. I said, Dad, you didn't even look at the bill. He said, I don't have to. I know we can't afford it. And what motivates me is I don't want other young people to be in that situation where they're presented with a great opportunity and then the door is slammed shut in front of them because school was too expensive, because they hadn't prepared for it. And so there are a lot of things you could do at the federal level, but at the state, the state level, you really are in charge of education. We can do a much better job there. In the treasurer's office, we're in charge of two college savings programs. I think that by working here, I can help a lot of families prepare for college and put kids on a pathway to success. And then the third answer to your question is I have an eight-year-old daughter. Now, she. Uh, I don't get to see her every night. I spend a lot of time on the road. I'm gone an awful lot. But I get to see her a whole lot more staying here in Illinois than I would if I flew off to DC and back every week. So that's my answer. I, as, as she gets older, maybe my attitude will change. Uh, but I don't know. As I told you all starting off here, be open to opportunities. And they present those. Be open to trying new things. So maybe someday I'll change my mind. But right now, I like this job. Uh, up right here. Uh, where did you live in Illinois as a kid? I grew up in the big city of Gifford, Illinois. I know there's at least one of you here who knows where that is. Well, there's, one, there's at least one of you here who lives in Gifford, Illinois. Uh, that'd be my nephew. Uh, it's, uh, if you've ever driven down Interstate 57, if you've gone by Rantoul, uh, I grew up pretty much eight miles east of Rantoul. And when I grew up, the sign said 800 people. Now they're approaching 1,000. So it's uh, turning into a big city.
All right. Uh, we're in the back here. Yes, with the glasses. The one pointing at yourself. That is a darn good question. It was 27 years ago. I don't remember. As, 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 as much, oh, if, I, if, if I remembered, I would tell you. I, I, but I just, uh, as much as Boys State was a positive experience for me, I don't remember my county. I made friends in different counties. All right, you got your arm sticking out in the middle of the aisle. What do you think about the overlap between Comptroller and Treasurer? He asked about the overlap between Comptroller and Treasurer. I think you can combine the two offices. I think you can find some savings. I'm supportive of that. Um, I think there's a reason they were segregated. It was to protect from fraud or abuse. You know, some people will say, can we combine the two offices and save a lot of money? And I say, you can save lots of money. You just, just give me all access to cash and we'll save you all kinds of money, except it makes it really easy for someone to steal. So you want to segregate duties, but if you combine the two offices, take some of the responsibilities that need to be segregated, the need to have internal controls in place, and move them to the governor's office, move them to the secretary of state's office, or move them to the auditor general's office. I think you could reorganize better, but that would require a change to the state constitution, and we're a little ways away from that. Yes. Okay. Up front here. Uh, somebody already was starting to college right now with the uh, program. Would that make any difference to get them to the So, in one year, uh, to be honest, not a lot. You really need to start earlier. You get the benefits of compounding interest. Now, if you put all your money in right now and you take risky investments, you put money into the stock market and you had a 20% return, yes, that would be very helpful. The problem is when you take risk, you also risk losing money. You could also see a downturn in the economy, and if you lost 20% of your savings today, it puts you in a worse position than you are today. Um, it can be helpful, but you know, really, we try and more advocate and treat for uh, younger students, families with younger children to start saving. But there's still scholarships out there, and there's lots of work you can do on that. Um, okay, we have lots more questions. I, have less, I don't know if there's time, but we do have a guy waving his hand and standing over here, and then I'll do one more, I'll ask them quickly, and then I'll, I'll get out of here. What can we do as young people to help better our state along with our state budget, like take issues and help progress? Yeah, so what can you all do? Um, you can become engaged. You can contact your representative, you can contact your state senator, you can contact the governor and say, this has gone on too long. Tell them I was looking at going to school. I want to stay at a state school in Illinois. But the lack of funding over the last few years has deteriorated the quality. The lack of uncertainty of funding has sent professors leaving some of these campuses. Please, put aside your differences. Invest in Illinois. I'm the state's chief investment officer. We invest in a lot of different things. But I can tell you the best investment you can make is in the education of young people. And I think that's why, as you look around here on the edges of this room, you see an awful lot of people who have been giving back for years. They're not here because, I don't think so, they're not here because they're getting rich doing this. Am I wrong? Are you going to get rich? No. They're here because they realize if our state is going to be strong, we need to have a well-educated, and that's in terms of school, and in terms of morals and citizenship, population. And they're making an investment in you. They take time out of their schedule. Some of these people take vacation not to go down to Florida, not to go sit on a beach, but to spend this week with you because they think it is worth their time and it will pay off. And I just ask you to consider that as you go forward and how you stay involved. So uh, the, first, the first easiest thing you can do, contact the governor, contact your representative, let them know this has to end. And then the other thing is just sort of stay involved. If you really want change, volunteer on a campaign. Find someone you agree with and help support them and get them in. And then lots of other opportunities from there, uh, depending on what your interests are. And we do need to go, but there's one guy who just really, really wants to ask a question in the back there. Um, that's a great question. When I ran for auditor, did I run for it because I thought that it would launch me to being treasurer, or did I do it because it's really what I wanted to do? The answer is neither one of those, to be honest. I, I didn't take it because I thought, this is the platform. This is the path I need. 
Now, I said earlier, I did things because they seemed interesting and they seemed challenging. So, the way I became auditor, I did win an election, but I was first appointed county auditor. Because the previous auditor had served for a long time, she'd served long enough, and she came to me and said, Mike, I am going to resign as county auditor. And I said, no, Jerry, you can't do that. You're great. People love you. And she said, no, no, no. I want you to replace me. My response to her was, I don't know if you know this, Jerry, but I have no experience in accounting. And she said, that's not a problem. I said, well, it seems like a problem to me. I think, I think the auditor ought to have some accounting experience. And her pitch to me was, look, we have CPAs in the office. They do a great job of running the office but they don't really like talking to the media. They don't really like talking to the elected officials on the county board. So what we really need is someone who is comfortable communicating with other people, someone who is comfortable managing other people, someone who's smart and can learn on the job. And she said, I think you can do that. And so after thinking on that about a week or so, I realized this was one of these opportunities that presented itself. It wasn't part of my, my path. It wasn't my plan to be there. But I said, it sure seems like it'll be a challenge. And I find it interesting to learn something new. That's how I chose it. And I spent four years as a county auditor. It was a great decision. So my advice there is, when presented with opportunities that you think might be interesting, but they're a little outside of my comfort zone, take them. You know, you don't know what you will learn. Because I also thought that I might want to go to law school. Some of you here think you might want to go to law school someday. Some of you, maybe you have parents who are lawyers, or maybe you just think like, well, that's, what, that's a good job. Maybe you ought to do that. That's what I thought. I didn't know what I wanted to do. People told me you should be a lawyer. So I went to work as a paralegal at a large corporate law firm because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I did it for about five months before I realized, I don't like this. This isn't fun. I don't wake up in the morning excited to go to work. Now, some people have said, oh, well, so you just wasted five months. And I said, no, I didn't waste five months. I did something. I learned an awful lot. And by doing that, I saved myself going to law school. I saved myself $150,000 in debt for something I realized I didn't want to do. And, you know, I could have found the same thing as auditor, but I found I actually liked it. And it's probably when I became auditor, I didn't start taking classes, and I took tests to become a certified public finance officer. And... It wasn't my path, but that's probably then what steered me towards running for state treasurer. I wish I could stay here and answer your questions all evening. I know there are lots more. I realize I talked for a while, but hopefully you've learned something from this talk here today. Your you have been given a great opportunity here. 27 years ago, I came to Boise State. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I met the governor of Illinois, and he told me I had opportunities, I had possibilities that I never dreamed of before. And it got me thinking. It got me challenged. And I have gone out, and I've just had great experiences. I don't think I'm going to motivate you like uh, Governor uh, Thompson did to me. But I encourage you, be open to possibilities. Challenge yourself. Take risks. And if you do that, I'll look forward to meeting you a few years down the road and hearing your stories of what you've done. And uh, it would be a pleasure to see you again. And just remember these people here along the, uh, the edges. Many of them participated in Boy State, where they served their country. And they deserve a lot of honor. And even though they gave a lot, they continue to come back and give to you. And don't forget that. As you go forward, to achieve success, bring some other people along with you. Don't forget to give back. Thank you very much. You're a great audience. Enjoy the rest of your voice today.
wonderful to be here with a former boy skater who's gone on to do a wonderful be here for me. Uh, a member of our state government who's working hard for all of us. So please first let's join and give you a round of applause. And now at this time I would like to invite Josh Patel, who was the treasurer of Boy State in 2016, to step forward to make a special presentation. So Treasurer Burks, on behalf of the citizens of the 82nd session of Boy State, it is our pleasure to inform you that a proclamation has been passed to recognize you as an honorary citizen of this session. So you're always been a citizen of the 55th session, now you're an honorary member of the 82nd session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Mark!
first of First of all, before we sit down, please join me in a big round of applause for the band and their director, Sam So please join me in a round of applause for our two great song leaders, Chuck Runyard and Greg Runyard. Yeah. And now remain standing for the invocation, which will be delivered by Jack Tehan from Gonzales City in Kennedy County and Mundelein, Illinois. Please bow your head and join me in prayer as you seek to. God, we thank you for all the opportunities and experiences this week has offered. We ask you to specifically remember all the veterans here who made this week possible. Lord, we keep all the members of previous Boy States in our intentions. Most importantly, those who fought for our country, who we remember today in today's memorial ceremony. Please bless us, Lord, and keep us safe as we make our journey home tomorrow. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce the President and Chairman of American Legion Illinois Premier Boy State, Mr. Chris Benigno. that uh, everyone is having an enjoyable experience. Fantastic. Our hope is that our program has added value to your lives. Our hope is that our program taught you the importance of community involvement responsibility. Our hope is that our program ignited something inside of you to make you want to do more for your fellow man or woman and to become the best versions of yourselves that you could possibly be. Remember, when you sit back, you have a full view of your life as it unravels before you. But when you participate, you control the outcome. Take time to embrace the wins in life, but more importantly, take the time needed to learn from each opportunity presented to you. Some of you may eventually hold some kind of office, whether it's serving on a board for a corporation or serving at the community, state, or even federal levels. Please remember one thing. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Always listen twice as much as you speak. That is a defining trait of a true leader. There are several ways to resolve an issue, but only one that's the best way, and by listening is how you will come to the right decision. Being a servant leader, you need to master balance. Being a servant leader means to always put others' needs before your own, but in doing so, don't neglect those who directly rely on you. Each and every one of you are now a member of an exclusive group of young men. You are now an American Legion, Illinois Premier Boys State alum, a few among many. But with this title comes great responsibility. 
Each of you are responsible for promoting our program so that others can have the same experiences that you had during your stay here. Not only to the incoming juniors at your respective schools, but to your guidance counselors, your principals, neighbors, friends, anyone that'll listen, and everyone you come in contact with throughout your lives. So remember this, you are the American Legion Illinois Premier Boys State. Hold your heads high and work hard, and the results will amaze you. Thank you for your attention. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our American Legion family leadership that's up here on stage. From the Sons of the American Legion, our detachment commander, Phil Shipley. From the American Legion, our past department commander and current national executive committeeman, Wayne Wagner. Our department senior vice commander, Bob Anderson. And now I would like to introduce, introduce to you our American Legion Department Commander, Gary Stanton. because I always want to start out with Golf Bravo 06, you are cleared to Navy Pensacola Airport via Victor 22, via Sockley, via Flight Plan Route. That's the job I had when I was in the Navy. Okay, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, citizens, fellow legionnaires, and sons, I want to thank all of you for participating in Boy State this week. Premier Boys State is a unique opportunity that truly does shape a lifetime. And I really want to thank you for allowing us to enter into your lives and create a sense of responsibility and trust and companionship, teamwork, all those spirited things that you've learned here at Boys State this week. So thank you. I would like to bring your attention to your citizenship manual. Those that don't have it, it's okay, you can read it later. On page 50, it talks about a special oath that you take of citizenship for Illini Boy State. And down at the bottom it says, I will make a formal, written, or oral report to my sponsor or sponsors upon my, uh, about my impressions of uh, Premier Boy State. So that's what I'm charging all of you with. When you get home, I want you to either call your legion that sponsored you or whatever group that sponsored you and say, hey, I'd really like to talk about Boy State and what we did. And they would love to have you come to a meeting and say, oh gosh, and all the kinds of things that you can tell about Boy State then, that would be wonderful. So please make sure that you stop in at your legion post and let them know. Now yesterday was Flag Day. Now that you've been here, and learned about how our government works, I want you to write to congressmen. I want you to tell them that you attended Patriotic Premier Boys State and you're asking for their support on the flag amendment. Both houses have the opportunity to pass a constitutional amendment to protect the flag. Needed is only a two-thirds majority in both houses so that they can get a three-fourths of the states that have to ratify it. So please put your skills to work that you've learned this week and make an effort to, to get out there and, and do that. Finally, I want you to go back to your local schools and ask your counselors if you can address the junior class the next time that they meet. After explaining all about Boys State, tell them to contact their local Legion post and ask them for information on next year's date and to get ready for Boy State. Because as you can see, we have a good, good attendance this year. 
but I would like to double that for next year because we are really a good program. We want to explain about it, and if nobody goes home and tells about it or talks about it, you won't have that opportunity. So please do that. I want you to thank you for allowing me to bring this greeting from the Department of Illinois, American Legion. And I want to remind you that when you go uh, to your computers, go to illegion.org, and up there you'll find a toolbar. And in that toolbar, it will say scholarships and forms. You'll go and click on that, and you'll find out all kinds of opportunities. There's an oratorical contest that we have in the spring. There's Eagle Scout awards that you can get for scholarship money. There's all kinds of opportunities that are available to you as Boy Staters and as uh, citizens. So please take that time, look it up, see if you want to apply for just one of those scholarships. Because you know what? Sometimes these scholarships, they don't get applied for. So the money just goes dormant. We don't want that to happen because you guys have earned the right to earn these scholarships. So please make an effort to attempt to apply for these scholarships and you'd be surprised what you might get. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. At this time, we will now award the model county flags based on your participation in activities today. Would yesterday's winners please bring the flags forward? You can hand them to Mr. McCrae right here at the corner of the stage. The winners for today, Thursday, in the Model County competition from the Lincoln Wing, Geiger. From the Reagan Wing, Kennedy. Today's overall model county, Gleason. ballots in the state general election and elected the six state constitutional officers of Illinois Boy State. At this time, I'm going to introduce each of them to you and then ask that they join me at the front of the stage. Once all six are assembled, we will issue them the oath of office. Your 2017 Boy State Treasurer, Aaron Banks. Your State Comptroller, Gavin Smith. Your Attorney General, Davin Stavrocki. Your Secretary of State, Taraj Rajendran. Your Lieutenant Governor, Corey Tegmeyer. And your 2017 Boy State Governor, David Nkansa.
going to ask the outgoing governor, Kevin Malady, to swear in the newly elected state officials. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of American Legion, Illinois, Illinois Premier Boys State. And the Constitution of Illinois Premier Boys State. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office to which I have been elected and I'll faithfully discharge the duties of the office I've been appointed <laughs> to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. I'm now going to ask the state officers to remain standing, and I'm going to ask the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to also join me up here on the stage. I read each of these young men's names. Presenting them with plaques will be Terry Stanton, the commander of the American Legion Department of Illinois, and Chris Benigno, the president and chairman of the American Legion Illinois Premier Boys Day. So first, the Speaker of the House, Mark Antonucci. Next, the President of the Senate, Dave Sorensen. <laughs> the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Rafael Torres. State Treasurer, Aaron Banks. <laughs> the State Comptroller, Gavin Smith. The Secretary of State, Siraj Rajendran. Your Lieutenant Governor, Corey Tetmeyer. And your Governor, David Nkansa.
And now to provide his inaugural address, the 82nd Governor of American Legion, Illinois Premier Boys State, your Governor, David Incontin. <laughs> I would like to uh, thank all the legionnaires and the uh, uh, counselors for all their hard work and time put into this program. So give them a round of applause. I can honestly say that this week has been the most amazing experience of my life. I've learned so much about government, politics, and most importantly, brotherhood. Yesterday, I witnessed a bond am amongst the counties that shocked everyone, including me. As I was sitting in my dorm room reflecting on the election that I just lost, I received a text message from my roommate, Ortiz, and he said, we're thinking about writing you in as a third party governor candidate. If you get enough signatures on a petition, you'll be able to speak and participate at the General Assembly. Thinking I was down for the count, I replied, is that even legal? <laughs> but as Winston Churchill once said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. A few minutes after receiving the text message, I walked down to the lobby of my building only to see multiple people from my county already starting my campaign. For the next four hours, we split up and ran around the campus attempting to acquire 25 signatures from each county. These are the lists these are the list of signatures that I got from all of you guys. And I really appreciate this. <laughs> the list included over 200 names, but unfortunately I failed to receive the necessary amount of, for, of signatures from each county. <laughs> perseverance throughout this journey has showed that I will be a governor that all of you can rely on. As a product of two African immigrants, hard work and determination are pillars of my life. Opportunities are more likely to come across in the United States than in, than in any third world country. My parents are fortunate enough, to, fortunate enough to receive admission to colleges in the United States. So with their eyes set on large goals, they moved to the United States and began to start their American dream. They always explain to me how chances are hard to come across, and you must take every opportunity to reach your goals. It's really been a pleasure working with all of you. I've met so many people from different walks of life, in different areas, from people that are from small towns, from large towns, and it's really been a humbling, humbling experience. So I'm going to announce a few names, and when I announce them, can you guys please stand up? So from Hayes County, can I, can Jack stand up? No, stay standing, stay standing. Ryan, you stand up? Isaac, you stand up? Andrew, you stand up? Of course, my roommate, Rapisha, stand up. Yeah. Actually, whole, whole Hayes County, stand up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and, then, and then we got Geiger. You guys stand up. Stand up. 
Bell County in the back will ask you guys to go. Can't forget Gleason. all of you guys too. We've been inducted into a brotherhood of a lifetime. Henry Ford once said, coming together is the beginning, keeping together is the process, and working together is the success. Thank you guys very much. session of Illinois Girl State. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the governor of Girl State from Freeburg, Illinois, Allison Bergkenner. Yeah. Hello, I'm Allison Bergkenner, and I know you're all wondering what the difference between girls and boys state is. If you look at what I've learned, this is typical girls state attire. And then when I walked in here today, I saw some boys in togas. Yeah. If that doesn't tell you the difference, I don't know what will. But as I said earlier, I'm Alison Burkheader, and I was elected the governor of the American Legion Auxiliary Illini Girl State last year. This coming week, I will lead this year's session until a new governor is elected. Through my experiences at Girl State, I learned a lesson that will impact my attitude towards my future challenges. Many people will tell you that odds are not good enough for accomplishing a dream or a goal. Some will even tell you not to try. They always have good intentions, but their mind is stuck in the numbers. If you think about it, a one in a million chance may sound really terrible, but what's stopping you from being that one person? Someone has to beat the odds, so why can't it be you? Sure, there's risk involved, but the worst that can happen is you not attain your goal. That's not the end of the world. Life will go on, and your dreams will become new dreams. In fact, prior to running for governor of Illini Girl State, I lost my race for student council president, and I was only racing against two people. I had been in student council for four years, and they had been in for one, and I still lost. So if that's not failure, I don't know what is. But, when I came to Girl State, I ran against 30 other girls and I won, somehow, just being myself. So if that's not beating the odds, I don't know what is. So to say nothing else, I leave you with this. No matter how big your dream is, chase it. Someone has to beat the odds and there's no reason that it can't be you. Thank you. This time I'm going to invite uh, you know, like the Governor in concept and Governor Burkhardt to both come forward. <laughs> so, Allison, it is my pleasure to announce that earlier today a proclamation was issued to recognize you as an honorary citizen of Boy State. So, Governor, if you could please present you with a, first of all, we have a plaque.
Okay. Earlier today were the finals of the Lincoln Oratorical Contest. From the 10 finalists, the winner was chosen, and it is now my pleasure to introduce him to you. He's here tonight to present his oration, the 2017 Oration Contest champion from Canapster County and Pittsfield, Illinois, Mr. Eli Tennite. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today, Abraham Lincoln. I imagine most of us here at Boys State can relate deeply to this quote and the meaning behind it. As young men with great ambitions, it's imperative that we do. The root of service is responsibility. Therefore, in order to serve and represent our peers, our communities, and our nation to the absolute peak of our abilities, we must shrug off the apathy that so encompasses our generation and learn to take up the yoke of responsible citizenship and servanthood. This much is clear. Putting it into practice, however, can be very difficult. That's why I think it's important that we look to the past for answers. In this case, how Abraham Lincoln used the virtue of responsibility to transform himself from a poor boy into a great man. I personally believe that the first and best step towards modern greatness is education. If this is true, then it's no wonder that Lincoln rose to such prominence. From a young age, Lincoln took an interest in his education. As a poor farm boy, there wouldn't have been much pushing him toward academic prowess. Nevertheless, he acted responsibly, often walking for miles to ensure that he was receiving an education. This passion for learning obviously stuck with him throughout the rest of his life. It's common knowledge that Lincoln would read anything he could get his hands on, whether it be borrowed books or the Bible. He acted responsibly to take in all that he could. And that affinity for reading certainly aided him in attending law school and later rising to fame in the courtrooms of Illinois. Lincoln's early responsibility was paying dividends. But it wasn't just his brains that took Lincoln far. One of the most famous stories of Lincoln's early adulthood shows just what kind of character Lincoln possessed as well. It goes like this. Lincoln was working as a store clerk when a woman was shortchanged a small amount of money. Instead of ignoring the seemingly small mistake, Lincoln walked miles to give the woman her money. Not only did he act responsibly, he acted with integrity. I often like to imagine being in Lincoln's shoes, large as they probably were, and imagine what would I have done in that situation? Would it have been the same thing? If I'm to answer honestly, I think probably not. I probably would have just held the change away, waiting for the woman to come back, instead of taking care of the issue in that moment and righting the wrong. And to be honest, this troubles me, as I think it should trouble us all and spur us into action because a great man can be measured by his small deeds when no one is watching. Of course, in Lincoln's case, the acts that made him truly great unfolded with a whole country watching. Lack of trust between the North and South over representation and moral issues such as slavery had tensions at the highest ever in the United States. In the early 1860s, the Union began to split under President Lincoln. The very construct of our forefathers was breaking and it seemed that there was no solution. But President Lincoln took responsibility for the continuation of the Union, the whole nation that he had sworn to serve and protect. And though I can't even imagine what sorrow must have been in his breast in doing so, he fought a war against his own, against our own brothers, to protect the brotherhood that we still enjoy today. Even through the war, Lincoln stayed true to his mission and always gave honor to those brave Americans who perished fighting both for and against the Union. Through his leadership and sacrifice, Lincoln preserved the nation that you and I call home today. And I can only imagine what the world might be like today had Lincoln not thought the Union worth fighting for. 
even against ourselves. How better then can we say thank you than taking Lincoln's fight as our own? Because just as he did, we can take responsibility for educating ourselves. Just as he did, we can pursue the truth and use it as our guide. Just as he did, we can become men of integrity, men who will stop at nothing to do what is right. And just as he did, we can fight for the freedom of our brothers and defend the country that ensures liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Gentlemen, as you'll remember, on the first day when we were together, we talked about the nine different $2,000 scholarships that were available during the week here. Tomorrow, at our awards assembly in the morning, nine of you will learn that you are the winners of those scholarships this year. Those scholarships are awarded once the winners enroll in college, and a number of last year's winners are here with us as members of our staff this year. And so tonight, I would like to present them with their checks as they move on to the next phase in their educational life and continue to be part of our Boy State family. So first of all, you've had a chance to hear from him a couple of times, including just a few minutes ago. The governor of Boy State 2016, the winner of a $2,000 scholarship, Kevin Mallody. Second, the winner of last year's Paul Brown State Officer Award and one of the two Senators to Boys Nation, so the winner of a $4,000 scholarship, Kuzi Bakwashi Zhu. of last year's essay contest and a winner of a $2,000 scholarship, Rohan Machurla. One of our 2016 model citizens and a senator to Boys Nation, the winner of a $4,000 scholarship, Ian McCormick. And our other 2016 model citizen, winner of a $2,000 scholarship, Mario Giannini. presenter tonight is retired Colonel Eric Ashworth. Many of you have had a chance to meet him and his staff over the last couple of days out on the field uh, participating in the physical skills course that they've set up. After serving in the Army for 30 years, Eric has taken the position at the University of Illinois 
as the Scholarships and Enrollment Officer of the Fighting Illini Army ROTC Department. He assists young people going to college that have an interest in serving in the U.S. Army in obtaining financial benefits to help them with college expenses. Tonight, Eric is going to be giving you information on the Army four-year scholarship. So I ask you to please give him your attention, and it's my honor to introduce Colonel Eric Ashworth. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, I, I had a slide show, but the bottom line is everyone looked like they were all fired up here, and I think I wanted to turn the lights out on all of you. But basically, I want to congratulate certainly all the teams for all their accomplishments that they, uh, they did. Uh, well done. I also want to congratulate the new leaders. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're very impressive, and you know, I wish you the best certainly the next, uh, you know, next year as you uh, lead uh, this great organization. Uh, and also to all of you, when you think about it, you know, you've done some nice work here. You've represented, obviously, your high schools. Uh, most of you are juniors, or I'm assuming you're juniors, and you're now off to the next step. And you say, well, what is the next step? Well, the next step is your seniors. And the first thing that you're probably going to start thinking about is, what am I going to do after I graduate? At least I hope you think about what you're going to do. Now, you just saw that a whole bunch of folks got some awesome scholarships. Done. So again, I congratulate all them as well. But what if you were not one of those people that did get the college? We heard the we heard the treasurer of the state say that education is important. He also said that when it's all said and done, that most people don't have the money to afford, you know, college. All right, you might be one of these guys that are out there saying, you know what, I'd like to go to college, but. I need our number of folks don't have the money to do that. Well, I'm here to tell you, you have it in your power to basically uh, get your, basically able to get your own way through school, okay? And if you don't believe me, I can tell you that I am one of those people. I came from a small town in upstate New York, or basically a farm town. I wanted to go to school, didn't have it, and so I tried for an Army ROTC scholarship. Okay. It's a four-year scholarship that you apply at the beginning of your senior year. And that's why I'm here talking to you tonight, okay? Because again, you're talking about probably by September you would want to put in for this scholarship. Again, it's for four years of college, all right? But guess what? The average college student that comes and sees me, they've already passed the deadline. So the best I can do is maybe get them a three-year, or maybe a two-year scholarship. I'm here to tell you, why wait? If this is something that interests you and stuff like that, I want you to be aware of it. So I've asked if they be kind enough to give you a few minutes of your time so you at least understand. I've gone around and i talked to a lot of high school guidance counselors, and I say, what do you guys tell the students about the military, some of the great scholarship opportunities there? You don't know. Well, but there's a lot of uh, high schools that don't have a lot of military background, and so they don't know that this, uh, this is an opportunity, okay? Now, um, we are going to discuss this scholarship a little bit, but we're going to play a game, okay? And this game is called Do You Know? Okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions, and we're hopefully going to be able to get you guys to know the answer. In my uh, final second minute here, uh, uh, second Lieutenant Marshall is going to give out gifts for those that get the right answers, all right? But hopefully the entire audience here will at least understand a little bit more about this and what the opportunities that you have that you have available, all right? So the first question is, and again, I'm talking about the Army, but please understand that we have Navy, Air Force, and Marines as well. So I'm not talking about most of these questions are not just for the Army. Okay, so first question for you is, what is college ROTC? Okay, we've got some gentlemen here. Stand up, please, and tell us your College ROTC is a reserve officer training for the four-year course that you go through so that you can become an officer in the military. There you go. The same thing is, all right, congratulations. All right. Again, it's a way to become an officer in the United States Army, okay? We're not talking English here, okay? Being an officer in the United States Army, you must have a four-year college course. Okay, you 
must have a degree in four years. Google bottom line is that they're looking for a way to help you get that four years. Okay, good. All right, the next question I got for you is what organization in the United States gives the most financial assistance to uh, college students and we're dealing with merit-based scholarships? Not need-based, but merit-based scholarships. Which organization? Anyone? Yes? Well, we're going to give it to them. Congratulations, but it's the military. All of you talking about all four services, it's the military. Can you believe this? I didn't even realize this until I got this job. And the military in this country values education so much that it gives out scholarships every year to the tune of $1 billion. Can you believe that? One billion. Because they want smart guys like you to be leading their soldiers. Okay? So they want to make sure they cover their education. All right. Good job. All right. So far we're two for two. Okay. The third question is, kind of get an idea about if you were fortunate enough to get one of these four-year scholarships, all right, I'm going to need the big check there, okay? Okay? How much are these scholarships worth? Do we just get that? Yes, go ahead. A lot of money. Okay, a lot of money. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit. What is a lot of money to you? I'll give you a chance to... Like a college tuition. Okay, all right, all right. We're going to go ahead and give that gentleman the feature here. Okay, I was fortunate enough this May to give Henry Fieldhouse a four-year scholarship okay, to the University of Illinois. Here's the scholarship check, $100,680. $100,000 to Henry Fieldhouse. Okay, right here. Okay, and again, this is to the University of Illinois. We're a state school. So if you get one to go to Notre Dame, or say Duke, or let's say some of these other big schools, Washington University in St. Louis, now you're talking to really good. Okay? All right, so this comes up to the fourth question. So what is covered with all this money? Okay? What, what is covered? Uh, let's get the COVID guy back here. Okay, what do you think? Okay, yes. It is tuition. All tuition and fees are covered. Okay, a stipend we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. And there's one other thing that's covered. Yes, you know what it is? No, sadly, you're not looking for it. It's not covered. But some of the universities do have rich alumni and they don't include that. Go ahead and get the guy a, a shirt. Or you, you know, that is part of the tradition. What it does. We're looking for one more thing. Yeah. Go ahead. I think he said six hundred dollars a semester for books, and you would be correct. Yes, I said I said. All right, good job, good job. So you can kind of see that this is pretty, pretty big stuff. Now, what is this next question? What is this stipend that we're talking about? Okay, who's heard of this? Yeah, you got this stipend, military stipend. What's that? All right, just tell us, tell us real quick. Yeah, I'll buy that, okay, he's, he's got it, okay? Basically, what the money, what the Army does is when I got my scholarship, we didn't have a stipend. And so guys my age, when we were there, we would go and get part-time jobs so we could go out and get pizza with our friends and stuff. Well, guess what? A lot of my buddies and stuff ended up failing their college, and so therefore, they were basically lost their scholarship, all because they were working instead of studying. So the Army said, well, we'll fix that. We'll pay the student to go to school and study. Doesn't mean you can't have a part-time job. You can't say, well, hey, this is my part-time job. I need it. And uh, so I wasn't able to study for the classes, right? Now, that amount, $300 a month as a freshman, Three fifty a month as a sophomore, four fifty as a junior, and five hundred bucks a month 
as a scheme. So you can kind of see how that money, when we're talking about $100,000, you can kind of see how it comes into play. All right. I was only given a short amount of time, so we'll finish up with a couple other things, and then we're finally done. Okay, how do you apply? Okay, how do you apply for one of these, if you're interested? Okay, the guy in Illinois, all right, I like that, Illinois, okay. Uh, you can buy online at dorms.com. Okay, apply online, well done. Okay, so you don't need to come see me, you don't need to see your high school uh, guidance counselor, although they might have some information for you. Here's what we're going to do. We can Marshall and I, and I mean, when this is done, we're going to be at, at the door. Mr. Curious will give you a piece of paper that has the information on it for you. Again, military service is not for everyone, okay? But again, as I stress, you all have it in your power. If college finances is an issue, you have it in your power to basically help your own cause, all right? Again, I don't know if this is being put out at the high school. I wanted to make sure that you knew this. Thank you for your time, and again, good luck. Gentlemen, we are now going to dim the lights. I'm going to ask you to draw your attention to the video on each side of me. We have received a very special message to each of you from the 42nd governor of the state of Illinois, Governor Bruce Rahman. Gentlemen, you have one night left to spend together here at Boy State. I know that many of you have formed very strong friendships during our short time here together. We all want nothing more than for you to enjoy your last night together with your newfound and hopefully lifelong friends. What I do ask is that you all help us make this last night at Boy State an enjoyable and orderly one for everyone. Once you have completed your county meetings, Please stay in your county areas throughout the evening. Please continue to be well behaved and respectful to each other. It has been a wonderful week, and let's make sure that we end it the same way. We'll have our final assembly and the presentation of awards here in the Lance Gymnasium at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. I look forward to seeing all of you then. 
The color guard will now advance and retrieve the colors of our country. You will stand in front of Please remain standing for the benediction, which will be delivered by Gernick Mocha from Roar City in Kanapsa County and Volo, Illinois. Please join me in prayer as you see fit. Dear God, thank you for the past week. The opportunities you have given us and the lessons learned will serve us well in the future. And now that we return home, help us apply these lessons in our communities. Help us not with finding the leaders of tomorrow, but instead, fill our hearts with the courage necessary to be these leaders, and bless us with the spirit of the lion to give us the strength to fight against injustice in all its forms and protect the name of our glorious nation, Liberty. Thank you. Gentlemen, at the conclusion of tonight's assembly, I would ask that you return your guidons to the gentlemen at the back of the gym. That will enable them to pack those up. That concludes tonight's general assembly. County counselors, please take charge of your counties. We are dismissed.